are so gonna wish you were here. Okay, well, it's it says it's recording. All right, so if, we're gonna trust if it's it. It's not that's on Skype. Okay, <laughs> so it's it's really great to talk to you. Um, I, I've got a list of questions here. But kind of first, could you tell me about yourself? Where, where are you from? How how did you wind up producing an episode for Nickelodeon? Thanks. Um, well, I'm from Northport, New York, um, and I I grew up uh, there. Northport's a, a small town outside of New York City on Long Island, um, and my mom and dad. Um, uh, worked as a, like a pharmacist and, and a gift shop owner. Uh, and they, they had like an adjoining business, which was rather like cute and charming. Uh, <laughs> it was like a very sitcom sort of opening. They they worked quite a bit, but I, I grew up sort of helping them and working in the store. And that was like early exposure to something like a production. Um, but my mom was a former art teacher and I, um, was fascinated from a young age with um, with drawing, writing phonetically, making little storybooks, and my obsession was the Muppets. So, just just about everything I drew was Muppet stories. You know, Muppets doing this, Muppets doing that. Sometimes an original character, uh, but they would meet the Muppets. Sometimes mashups of my favorite TV shows, but they would meet the Muppets. And I became so obsessed that my parents bought me a book called Of Muppets and Men, which I may have here, <laughs> uh, The Making of the Muppet Show. And they were a little worried because they thought I might be upset to learn that, you know, the Muppets were not real and that they, <laughs> you know, controlled by people. Um, but what was immediately apparent to me was that you know, this magic of seeing these characters come to life was sustainable with this reality of the people working underneath and, and that this did nothing to um, to remove the magic of, of that. And so, you know, I just became fascinated with puppetry and I became fascinated with um, proscenium, what we have right here. I didn't know that's what it was called, but the, the frame, you know, the mirror in my bedroom suddenly that's became... Proscenium? How do you spell that? Um, mm, that's, I'm going to check. There's a C in there somewhere. P-R-O-S-C-E-N-I-U-M, proscenium. The part so, of the theater stage in front of the curtain. Okay, so it's what the audience sees and what they're expected to focus on. Yes, and what's that? What that has become in modern cinema really is the frame. So anything below the frame of the puppet is outside the proscenium or the stage. Anything within is perceived by the audience as a reality. So it was completely sustainable to me that a puppeteer creator like Jim Henson could be one reality and, you know, Kermit the Frog could be another reality unto himself. You're and good so, at that. <laughs> thank you. Well, that was my first obsession. I did puppetry in front of my mirror. I syncopated my hands to music um, so that I could learn. Okay, syncopated. Could you tell, tell us what Spell that, that? means? <laughs> Well, uh, just uh, tell us what it means. I know what it means, but I'm not sure that my listeners will. Oh, I love, I love that you do that. Um, so syncopation would be to put myself um, in rhythm or timing with something else. So I would play a song, and I would try to match the syllables in the lyrics of the song uh, to my hand movements, so that the puppet would appear to be in synchronization, same time as the music. And that taught me some muscle memory to become a puppeteer. It, it taught me, um, I think in a way to respect um, music and lyrics and words. So all this was coming together for me as I grew up because I was just fascinated with words and images. And as I started to leave the Muppets behind and start watching you know, movies and television shows that became my fascination. I was always aware that somebody was behind the scenes 
making these amazing movies and shows real. Um, Star Trek and Star Wars and, um, you know, pretty much anything. I'm an 80s kid, so I grew up on a lot of, you know, those um, early, um, early blockbusters, you know, that have since kind of brought a lot of the industry down. <laughs> but um, I was just fascinated. So I, I just became a mimic in other ways. If I enjoyed a TV show, I did everything in my power to try to find a script from the television show so I could see how the characters were written. Um, and we didn't have as much internet exposure until I was in my late teens. So a lot of times I just had to look, um, my, you know, I had a very supportive father who'd take me to bookstores to find books on the making of television shows, or um, I would go to the library and occasionally you could find people who sold uh, screenplays. Today, for those of you watching, any show or movie you're interested in, you can really just Google. And if you look specifically for a .pdf file, which is a scan of a, uh, a visual scan of um, a document, you can usually find scripts online readily available. Um, and it's really wonderful to kind of study the bare bones of how something is made. So if I liked Star Wars, I would read the book or I would read the script and try to understand how it all came together. And this just became my obsession. And it's why I love working with people who have healthy obsessions because you just can't help but deconstruct things, pick them apart to see how they work and want to learn to, even if you don't reconstruct them yourself, just kind of fascinated, um, which is what I like about you, Betty, you know, you, you, are an avid deconstructor and you like to lay out all the pieces as you see them, you know, and um, that's that speaks to me. That speaks to a lot of writers I know um, and artists I know. So um, to get to, to sum this up, um, I began going to school um, in my undergraduate college year for film and television, which introduced me to some common friends with the same interests. And my friends and I developed a puppet character because they discovered I had that talent named Greg the Bunny. And Greg <laughs> the Bunny was a sweet neurotic little rabbit on a show that was um, we made ourselves for public access television, which was pre YouTube. And um, we had some success with it. People in our local area were watching and um, we were able to get uh, a few short films made for the independent film channel, which was our, our first like professional industry job, but it was all very um, DIY. You know, uh, you, you really have to be able to kind of just put things together with whatever you have. And my friends and I would do that. And we frankly still are doing that. You know, the Glitch Text is funded by a great deal of money by, people at Nickelodeon who, you know, created our production. But at the end of the day, it still feels like a bunch of kids in the garage just putting a show together with whatever they've got. And so, so yeah, that kind of leads me into a question I have. Getting the, doing the animation or the puppeteering for a human shape is very yes. well studied and very well understood. But especially with glitch text, but anytime you branch out from the human, the I imagine that the amount of information on how to animate and like for a rabbit or for a bird, I imagine that the information on how to animate, how to get the syncopation correct, just goes down the further out you get from humans and our most common animals. So for yeah. a show like glitch text, where you've got something like Alpha the Robot or that giant purple beast from the early episodes, how, what challenges do you face in animating something that has so little information on how to animate it behind it? It's, um, well, usually everything is t interpreted from something else. So if we want to create, um, you know, a creature like Alpha, the first thing that um, our design team and our storyboard team might do is look at uh, anatomy of something that's comparable, like in Alpha's case, maybe like a simian 
uh, creature like a gorilla or an ape, or well, they're the same, an ape uh, or, or a monkey or something that a great might ape. move yeah. with that same uh, gait. Um, and then taking that inspiration as a basis, you would kind of extrapolate from there. There are other points of reference that can be used that may exist in other mediums. Um, a lot of times we will be, you know, take inspiration from other animations, etc. But usually, if some, even if something seems inhuman, like a big purple creature in Adventures in Pet Training, that may move with a fluidity that is still the anatomy of studying something like water or smoke or, you know, um, really it's all about reference, just the same way I would read scripts and pick them apart. Um, those who, who animate and do visual storytelling will usually pick apart reference either from live action or from other animation sources and countless uh, books. This is one of the best for people who are brand new into learning some of the basic tenets of animation. Um, and I say this because, you know, this was my first animated series, not that I'd written on, but that I'd produced on. And I put a great deal of you know, my faith in the amazing people I was working with, um, Eric Robles and Ian Graham, who all had a tremendous amount of experience, our producer Lisa Woods, um, who's not talked about nearly enough. Um, but and I sort of learned as I went um, and having a great deal of respect for artists and and their process really helped us because you know, we wrote based on what we felt the strengths of our team were um, and they inspired us rather than us just coming up with something random and, you know, expecting them to execute it. We, we had our best success when we learned what their strengths were and we played to those. Okay, so that leads me to another question. Now that you mention it, your the movement of water and how how water moves. It's so good in the show that I have I really haven't even thought about it. But now that I think about it, your your water animation is top notch. And the reason that strikes me is that in physics class, hydrodynamics, the physics of the movement of water, is incredibly difficult. It's kind of the make or break yes. when you're in physics class. If you 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 come up to hydrodynamics and your physics teacher asks you, it only gets harder from here. Are you really sure you want to be in physics? And I noped out of there long before I reached hydrodynamics. But the, the dynamics of water movement are so complex. And to make it appear natural, you really have to understand the physics of it. So tell, tell me a little bit about that. I don't even think I have enough of the vocabulary to make a good question out of it. Well, I and and, you know, and I don't know. I, I think I can give a satisfying answer for for me, for my knowledge of skill, but mostly I'm just borrowing from other people. Like my my wife um, is an MIT graduate. She she did some computer physics for special effects um, in movies like Star Wars oh. Episode One and uh, Wild Wild West and, and a bunch of um, DreamWorks animations earlier in, in her career. And one of her friends, uh, Christopher Horvath, worked at ILM and actually developed the first CG simulation of water, the first code that simulated water, because even in the days of early computer generated graphics, they would use miniatures for water. It was just so difficult to to achieve everything you just. Um, yeah, I, I remember that. I remember thinking, man, the, the water looks a lot better than everything else. But I think the miniatures. movie the perfect storm i think was the first movie to use that code and i think to this day when you see water in a cg film it's essentially that same code um now we don't use that technology in 2d animation um and i would i would leave it to one of our actual animators at one of our companies to explain it more or one of our supervisors but i will say that simulation getting getting something that's close works just as well and a lot of times that we they'll just look at reference of say um, a curtain or or how um, how something that's actually kind of flat like a blanket or a sheet or a cape moves when it is buoyed by um, wind, and that gives you a sense of wave and fluidity that if you kind of mimic that uh, can also look very much like water. So. 
So you're you essentially know. using the same visual tricks that they used 100 years ago for cinematography, but you're doing it digitally. That's correct, because again, whatever it takes to create the illusion within the proscenium is fair game. So whatever that requires, um, that's what we do. A lot of people compliment Glitch Text as having very fluid animation, yes. and we appreciate that. And our, our trick is that we use um, Tune Boom Harmony, which is a, um, a, a, a CG program that creates characters uh, almost like stop motion puppets, um, which flash animation accomplishes as well. And that normally makes characters look very stiff, but when you bring in hand-drawn animation to also come in and sort of customize the movements um, where appropriate, you get a much more fluid style. So when the characters are just kind of sitting in the van talking, it's pure tune boom. When they're leaping and jumping and doing something really um, dynamic, that's when hand-drawn animation kind of takes over and helps those those puppets along. And that is something that we learned uh, from studying the work of Ankama Studios, who had created a show called Walk Fu, which you can see on Netflix. Um, and Eric Robles absolutely loving their style and inquiring with them uh, and, and, and us working with them early on to learn a little bit about what they were doing. So it's all whatever we can do to achieve the best you know, result within that frame. And usually all that limits you is your imagination, money, support of your studio in being experimental, you know, and we, we fortunately had a great deal of encouragement from Nickelodeon in pursuing that. Okay, so that really leads very well into kind of my big animation question, because it's in the, uh, which, which episode was it? Colossus or Settling the Score. Yes. And it's where Fives is driving up and he's getting more excited as they approach the big glitch. And then Colossosaurus's leg passes in front of his van. Now, the one and only drawing class that I have ever willingly taken, not counting all the <laughs> ones you take in school, is a botanical illustration. And so when I saw those leaves that were passing between the viewer's line of sight and Colossosaurus's legs, my brain immediately ID'd them as maple leaves. And it was so quick and so natural that I didn't even think of it at the time, though, but those were, those were maple leaves. You described them as looking like bird's feet. They're kind of a three-pointed <laughs> shape, but yeah. from the perspective of botanical illustration, those are maple leaves. Absolutely. And Absolutely. it immediately hit my brain because another show that I'd watched a few years ago used that almost that exact same composition. Mm. And it was a, it was a CGI show and there was just a few factors that they were so similar i had to ask if they were related because it's a giant basically a kaiju massive limbs passing in front of the screen and between the limb and the oh. viewer you have these big drifting maple leaves now it's a different style of animation and there were so many maple leaves i kind of assumed that they discovered a new trick and were just having fun with it but i'm i can't remember any other specific examples but the concept of a law, and in the animation, this is not a critique of your animation, because I think it was deliberate, the maple leaves are far too large in that scene. Yes. And just as they were far too large in the other scene, like these maple leaves would have been three times the size of Five's head. And big leaf maple leaves are pretty big, but they're not that big. That's a wonderful so, example of cheating for the proscenium. If, the, if those leaves pass through, it's because we want that sensation of wind in motion. Um, if it's too small on a one-to-one -one scale with what it would actually be, the effect is dis diminished. So it's there, it's accurate, but even in live action, sometimes you'll accomplish that. Like, you know, if you put a camera out on a snowy day, a lot of times you may find in the live action world, the snow's not even reading on the camera or the <laughs> rain. There's a great comedy called Wet Hot American Summer. It's, it's R-rated, so it's for older audiences, but uh, it's a summer camp movie that I understand the entire, it was raining the entire shoot and you, and you can't really see it because it doesn't show up on camera. So anyway, all this to say that's when you take artistic license and you say, well, we're going to make those leaves bigger because the emotional need uh, and, and the need for your eye to catch this motion is more important than us simulating the reality. Um, as for the, and judgment calls like that, frankly, are what a, a huge part of the job of 
animation directors um, and and producers is is about. You know, you make these little judgment calls as they come up. Um, I don't know if those two shots are connected. Sometimes I find things are similar because there is this like poetic language that's common um, that where things just arise. Sometimes it's a subconscious awareness of, you know, that that language comes from a subconscious awareness of things in the past, but other times it's very deliberate. There are many poses and shots in our show. I just uh, mentioned one yesterday that was based on a Pokemon series from settling the score, which I can talk about later, but um, so a lot of times we do pull specific reference. If if somebody needs to do a kaiju sequence, they're going to look up what other people have done, and that's not with the intention of theft. It's the intention of inspiration and yeah. very much, you know, artistic fair game. You know, everything is somewhat derivative, and these things are usually homages and love letters to things that we love and are inspired by. Um, yeah, it kind of struck me because. Uh, do you know the really? It's an old, old movie, Land of the Giants. Mm -hmm. I have uh, my one of my my. Uh, you know when you're a kid and you your parents have friends and you spend end up spending a lot of time at their houses. One of my parents' friends, uh, Cliff Short, he had this amazing house. I mean, as a child, I loved it. He was a chainsaw artist. He did oh wood like carvings out of the redwoods there in California. Incredible. And he did the arm for Land of the Giants that comes down and picks up. He did the animatronics. He crafted it. Oh. And I, I was thinking that I don't know. I, I actually haven't seen that clip in literally 30 years, not since I was tiny. So I can't remember if there was any of that thing. But I, I was thinking this scene might be just an effect of the not limitations of the proscenium, but just the things you have to do to make it work. Because when you have a very small yeah. person and a giant monster, you you kind of have to use limbs and then references to, to let you know how big these limbs are. I love that you're bringing this up because it all goes back to that Muppet reference. Because to again, like borrow the concept of Kermit the Frog, uh, there's a there's a famous um, sketch where um, Kermit the Frog sang the song Happy Feet and he did a tap dance and he was dancing the whole time and the camera never showed the feet. And of course, we have to presume that's happening. It's all an illusion. Similarly, in a something like a Muppet movie, the human puppet relationship would be something like this. But in a wide shot, this puppet would not even be in frame because their feet are touching the ground way below. And yet we can cut from a shot of the puppet standing to a shot of the puppet at this cheated, you know, this sort of unrealistic height, but it makes cinematic sense to our brains. And sometimes those, again, those leaps are what makes the magic. And you can step back and break it but if it's done right and it's charming enough, even when you see that it's, you know, incorrect, you you kind of, your brain says, yeah, but I don't want to think about that. <laughs> you know. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for all these wonderful animation questions. But you made a show. Can you tell me about the origins of Glitch Ticks? Because uh, I know from my own stories, from my own books, they're just how it came to be is a really long story. Where did Glitch Ticks come from? Um, it, it really came from the mind of Eric Robles, whose touchstones when thinking about um, creating things are really the relatability of, of, of children and childhood. And he, he loved shows he grew up with like Ghostbusters and Men in Black and, and other shows that like empowered um, kids to face their fears or take on the supernatural in some way. So you, you um, mean the, the animated versions? The animated versions, yeah. He he was thinking to himself, why do we not see more properties like that? You know, it would be really fun to create something in that genre. But then he kind of left that alone and became also more fascinated with the idea of, you know, that time in, in a child's life when there may be um, becoming more of an, an adult or a teenager and they're, they're having their first job. Um, and so he wrote a little, and he storyboarded a little short film about a, a boy named uh, High Five and a robot named 8-Bit in the future 
where they basically went door to door performing um, exterminations for um, video game glitches. And the comedy of it was that to them, it was a normal, boring job. <laughs> the, there was things popping out of people's game consoles and the people were screaming, but the boy and the robot were like, well, what do you want to get for lunch after this? You know, they just, to them, it was just what they do. And that tone really spoke to me. And, you know, as I got to know Eric Robles, it was also another side of him. He'd been doing very broad comedy with a show like Fanboy and Chum Chum, but he'd had a lot of experience, not only in action, but he had a sensibility for some kind of dry comedy, which I really loved. And it just so happened that, um, you know, I just have always been an enormously huge Ghostbusters fan. The movie Ghostbusters and the show that eventually followed were hugely inspirational to me. One of the things that was inspiring to me, um, mostly because I like the accessibility of it to an audience, the idea that there was a place for misfits who didn't want to become police officers or join the fire department or the army. You could go and potentially um, inside one of these odd little buildings where people were fighting the supernatural with tools of their own design. Um, they were they were getting by on their wits and their bravery and a little bit of desperation. And um, that just triggered my imagination. So when I heard he had this idea, I just as a friend of his, I gave him a ton of feedback. I, I dumped 20 plus years of my own imaginative, you know, things I'd been collecting over the years on him because I thought it was such a good idea. I, I felt certain he was going to have some success with it. And his response was overwhelming. And he said, well, why don't we just try doing this together? And we went uh, and took a meeting with Jenna Boyd, who was the head of development at the time. Eric had already been encouraged by the head of the studio, Russell Hicks, who had seen his little short um, concept. And we all talked about it and they just encouraged us to drop everything else we were doing and start developing this because I think they could see we were excited. Uh, and it certainly had a strong concept and we we sort of built from there and every step along the way you start to add people to your team you know you, you have an idea and you're excited you tell your friends and they tell their friends and some just um some get directly involved and others are just in the peripheral but that's how something starts to grow and nickelodeon was very good at the time about cultivating that kind of environment so that's really how it got going See, I find this very interesting, especially what you said about Robles, because I, too, have a penchant for that very dry comedy that just set, kind of steps back and focuses on the absurdity of human nature, specifically how no matter how crazy or exceptional the situation is, a very short amount of exposure is enough to make to kind of make us j cynical and jaded towards it. Yeah. And that's that sort of inherent absurdity in human nature is how I write most of my stories. I just kind of focus on that. And I found a very dedicated audience for that. People love that. So yeah. Um, yeah. There's a rhythm to it. It's, it's hard sometimes to simulate an animation, but we, we never gave up and we were able to achieve it. There, there's a line in settling the score where if you read it on the page, it's just Miko challenges Mike Sims to a dance off. Mike, uh, five tries to defuse it. He's like, Mike, you don't, sh she's a little out of her mind. You don't have to say yes. Mike says yes. And five just goes, wow. And then Miko <laughs> keeps going. And that little wow, which is almost like a very dry actor take is a little unusual for animation. And it requires everyone involved to understand what that rhythm basically is. It, it starts with just directing the actors in the rhythm. And then the artist can kind of pick up on it. Um, and then when that's animated, if it doesn't work perfectly, we edit in the edit room to get the timing just right. But that's like a dry moment. And pretty much every line from Phil is a dry moment. Um, and giving kids that kind of wisdom is important because most of the kids I know are very self-referential and very aware of tropes. Like I love the idea that our characters 
they know they know their life is like a movie with this job and they embrace it joyfully and other times they almost point at it and make fun of it like in Ralphie Bear is back I think Nico literally says like five you're throwing off our dynamic <laughs> like when, <laughs> when you're being impulsive and I'm uh the voice of reason that doesn't sit right with me or breaking the formula or okay now you know. all right this brings up a bit a big question that just occurred to me and i don't know why it just occurred to me it's true before in my line of work we call it you human very well but this is something uh-huh. else. this isn't just humaning very well this is childing very well and i teach i work with children all the time and so I, do, I not only have my own memories from my childhood, but how did you how did you as adults manage to capture that special moment between child and adult, that 15, 16 year old that because they mm-hmm. all of your characters seem so real given their own situations. And like these are kids that I've had to sit down and teach algebra to. So they're wow. they just feel very accurate they're real that so much we appreciate that so much it was definitely a a goal because one of the things we don't like is when we feel anyone is misrepresented particularly children in animation um but also uh nerds gamers uh um you know people in general of any age and it's a hard thing to do but you know i think when everybody is predisposed to trying to watchdog that, there's a tendency to police each other. So if I would write something that was getting a little too serious or a little too in its own head with the sci-fi, um, Eric would remind me like, this needs to be fun. Like High Five can't be too stressed out because even though his situation is stressful, he's still he's living his dream right now being in this video game. And a lot of times it would be this subtle mix of making sure Five had time to, or any character had time to to experience joy before fear, or, you know, which humanizes them, gives them hopefully real life reactions to things. You know, how would I react if I were in this situation? Um, I don't know, I'm sort of going in all directions. I, another thing is you just want people on your team to kind of be young at heart and still be in touch with the the child inside and be able to kind of, you know, everybody has to be an actor to some extent and put themselves in that situation. And then we would also, we did some early internal testing on the show to see how kids were reacting and if they felt it was genuine. The best compliment we ever got was some kid saying, this is like superheroes, but real, you know, (laughs) and they loved, you know, the network was a little nervous that our male lead wasn't leaping into every situation with this mask of bravery, which is a mask too many young males live in. And um, we really pushed against that. We said, we want him to be healthfully afraid and not charge into danger uh, blindly. We, we, that doesn't feel real to us. I mean, I think Indiana Jones has been a wonderful role model for decades because that character, at least, even though it, it's a superhuman it character, <laughs> yeah, he has those moments. And that's, you know, he sees a giant boulder and he doesn't just charge. He, he makes a face like, oh my God, and then he does it. So that led to five saying things like oh gosh you're really scary and running from a giant ginkgo but he still stands up and does the brave thing um you know being brave is not the lack of fear it's acting in spite of fear so you know and sometimes you have to remind even executives and and other artists that that's what that word literally means but all this to say i don't know we just appreciate it if if something felt false to anyone they would speak up so ashley birch brought her truth to it um you know all all the writers um sandy parikh and david and Axagoras, they brought their truth and if they detected something felt false particularly with regard to the characters or to their point of view as as children um then we we made changes and that was part of the refinement process because when the characters were first invented they were very archetypal. Five was like 
bookish and nervous and overbearing and Miko was flighty and impulsive. Um, and they were pretty much undefined outside of that. But it was it was a it started us off with something we could work with. And then as we massaged them and sort of humanized them, they took form as like fully fleshed out characters. And that took a, a while, it took a few years even to really find that. Okay, that really leads well into another question I have. During this creative process, when you were fleshing them out, was there any part of this creation process where it really hurt you to give something up, but you knew it was holding the character back and it had to be pruned off, but it really kind of hurt you artistically to cut off that dead weight? I wouldn't say it hurt artistically, but, you know, as I was saying, it began as a boy in his robot story. And pretty quickly, we had Miko as a really strong third character, but she was a supporting character. And Jenna said, she's amazing. They should be partners. I'm not as interested in the robot. Just give me a two-hander lead show, which is a way of saying, you know, two main characters. Um, a bo this boy and girl, for lack of a better way to identify them. And, um, and let's work with that relationship. And Eric is, you know, very... He's from a Latino upbringing. He um, has amazing sisters and female friends, but he had not done a lot of writing for women. He's he's fond of saying that we were both gripped with fear by this task, and um, <laughs> I, you know, and I was I was less so. Um, I, that did not intimidate me so much as I just didn't know how to, how we were gonna. Um, uh, create this balance because we still had the, this this cool factor of this awesome robot in mind. But pretty quickly we realized this robot does not, he just needs to not be a third lead in this show. It's not about two kids and their big robot. It's about these two kids. So that kids was and Alpha and not Bit. It was really, at first Bit was um, the third member of the team he had so many lines. Um, he existed in many different forms. And eventually, it was he really in the pilot that I realized Bit cannot be a, a big part of this show um, right now, the way we had originally envisioned. Because if you notice in the pilot, he jumps in to help the techs, and then we immediately discard him <laughs> narratively because nobody wants um, somebody who knows better taking over for these kids and nobody wants somebody stronger than them bailing them out. They lose their license as characters to solve their own problems. And so, you know, that was a, something that it wasn't an artistic sacrifice. It's just that if I had it to do over again, I would have done it sooner, but it took us a few episodes before we realized like Bit's not going to come in and become a third lead of this show, nor should he. It's about people. It's not about the glitches and it's not about the concept. It should be about these characters. Um, so that was something that took a while. There was no pain though. Nothing, nothing got noted out of the show, thankfully, that we really believed in and had to sacrifice. Um, which has never happened to me before. This is the first show where I think pretty much everything we intended and more eventually came to fruition and the things that fell to the wayside um, did so because they just weren't really, they, they proved unnecessary. Okay, so another thing that I really, really like about your characters and the characters is that they have some very, very serious character flaws. I mean, if these were people these, and especially like if these were students under my teaching, these would be things I'd be actively trying to help them overcome. So, yes. And let's just start with the most glaring example, Mitch Williams. He yes. is a deeply disagreeable person, but no less a hero than Five or Miko. And was that, first off, kind of a broader question, was that a conscious decision going in or did it just happen kind of organically that you, you've created these characters with some pretty deep character flaws? I would say it was organic. Um, uh, it it was very difficult at first to find the flaws in Miko because she was such an amazing powerhouse of a character that we had to sit down and say, okay, what can she not do? What things stop her in her tracks? And 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 that 
th that was a whole conversation and some experimentation with Mitch specifically when we began there, there's an 11 minute pilot that we did to test the concept of the show that eventually we can reveal someday and maybe I'll, I'll share some some stills with you because um, I don't think anybody's really shown that stuff before so you can have something for people to see but when we introduced Mitch originally he was more like a character from fanboy and chum chum he was more like this um cartoonish for lack of a better word you know one dimensional villain who's just out to get them you know five low resolution away. yeah he was a low res character and we only had a few lines for him he was just the um antagonist and we saw a bunch of people for auditions and one of them was Luke Youngblood who came in and said, um, should I do my American accent? And I was like, what? <laughs> and he's like, oh, usually I, I don't use my accent. I usually do an American accent. And, and I was like, no, just be you, <laughs> you know, like if, you, if I mean, I've acted before, but suddenly it felt so false to me that this person would like change who they were. <laughs> to please us you know so uh, i if i was more just socially awkward about it than anything else he got in that booth and his voice brought such uh like a depth to the character and it's not just romanticism about the accent it's also that he's an amazing actor and our first thought was um wow he's amazing so he can't be Mitch. We're going to have to write him his own part. We're going to create a part for this actor. But oh my God, we've got so many characters already. And then it took like a day f for me to realize, well, wait, why can't he be Mitch? Like, he, Why can't Mitch be this new character we're writing? Like, Mitch doesn't have to be some wooden character. So we rebuilt Mitch based on Luke. So in every case, really, the actors inspired the the characters from popping off the page into a third dimensional form and we realized like this character deserves as much respect as anyone else in the cast and so do all our supporting characters in fact you know everyone should be a lead on the show and it's just you know just because the camera may not point at them all the time doesn't mean they should be any less developed than the leads and so with Mitch, it took a, a while, but I think right away we realized he should just be the closest we get to like a cautionary tale. He's he's just what happens when you, um, you know, you can make you can really succeed at something if it's all you do. But of course, the sacrifice is, you know, you you aren't as well developed in other areas. So Mitch is someone to borrow from the RPG thing. He's he's dumped all his stats into, you know, his uh, prowess as a glitch tech, but his charisma score has fallen. His his wisdom score has fallen. And, you know, he's somebody who you would hope would learn to be a little bit more well-rounded. And I think he knows it. And that's the thing that's interesting. You catch these glimpses where he's like, you know, those blueberries aren't aren't as dedicated as I am, but I'm a little jealous of them because they, you know, th they have something that I kind of sacrificed and that's sweet. You know, it's kind of yeah. sweetly tragic and there's hope, there's hope for him as there's hope for everybody, you know? Um, so that, that was really just how Mitch began.